Hi and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be looking at 8-bit sound cards. I recently got a small XT class machine made by Amstrad that didn't have any sound capabilities built into it so I started looking around for ways to get some sound into one of its 8-bit expansion slots and was quite horrified to see the cost and rarity of these things so that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. So the plan is to get some 8-bit sound into this machine without spending too much money. So I came up with three options and that's what we're going to explore here today. So the three choices here, one of them is to use an existing 16-bit ISA sound card. I've read but don't know for sure that some 16-bit sound cards will work in an 8-bit slot with the back part of the 16-bit connector only being used for things like the CD-ROM header. Then the other option is to buy an 8-bit sound card on eBay, which I also did. And the other option was to buy this do-it-yourself kit. So we're going to build an 8-bit card as well. At the time when I first needed the 8-bit sound card, I couldn't find any reasonably priced ones anywhere. So that's when I came across these kits. And there were also ready assembled ad-lib clone cards as well, using modern components to be had on eBay and other places too. So I chose this one, which is from a company called AA Pro. I haven't seen uh, any of these kicking around on eBay lately, so I don't know whether they just release them in batches or whatever. But this one is just the standard ad-lib clone card. It has a real OPL2 chip and comes in its various bits and pieces. Now I know what a soldering iron is, but I'm by no means even competent, never mind an expert. So that partly the aim of this is to show that if anybody's a bit timid about trying this kind of thing, if I can do it, then anybody can do it. It's got a very funky little printed PCB here with little musical notes and staves and things on it. It looks great. It's just a shame you didn't have window cases back in those days. There's a little bag of what looks like resistors and capacitors and such like. A little packet with a load of ICs and sockets on it. And a bracket to mount the thing onto the case. The instructions are very, very intuitive. It clearly labels what each part is, what hole it should go to in the board, and all of the holes on the board are clearly marked with letters and numbers to match the instructions. Time to heat up the soldering iron and just see how this puppy hangs together. So there's a bunch of little ceramic capacitors go on the back here, so they're not polarised, so just bang them on and we'll get those soldered into place. The instructions basically list the order, or the suggested order, that they suggest you put things on in. So I'm just following that line by line, component by component. This board is very well masked. You can't even see the traces. It's underneath this white masking. So it's very difficult to make any mistakes, I think. Basically, you've only got one target. That's your solder pad. And they're all fairly well spaced out as well. Obviously, the IC ones are quite close, but I still don't think they're so close that it isn't fairly simple to hit your target. And I couldn't see you having any problems with this unless you sort of bashed away at it so hard that you may be detached to the pad. Looking good so far. We'll find out soon enough whether I've cocked it up. Now this board actually comes in two versions. There's the AdLib clone, which is what we have here, and there's also an AdLib Pro clone. So on the instructions here, it's telling me to run jumpers across some unpopulated component slots. And you can buy this kit as a separate add-on, or you can buy it ready built with the Pro Kit already installed. I've actually bought the Pro Kit, but what I'm going to do here is just build it as the standard AdLib, run these jumpers across the missing components and see what that sounds like. And then I'll install the Pro Kit and see if that makes any difference and if it's worth the extra money. I didn't pick this kit for any particular reason other than it was a UK seller, so I got it quickly and it appears to be made in the UK this one so I imagine there's different variations made by lots of different people and there's probably plenty of Chinese versions all doing similar things available from different places on the internet. Just in case of getting the last components on, there's a few capacitors and then the ICs and one of them is socketed, so pop that into the socket as well. And here's our Yamaha YN3812 OPL2 chip which reliably informed by the manufacturer is genuine and fully tested. So that's that. The first part of the ad lib is built. We'll just give it a quick clean and then we'll give it a go. 
This is the machine that caused me to go searching for 8-bit ISA cards in the first place. It's got two free 8-bit ISA slots and it only has an 8-bit ISA bus. So it kind of restricted me to what I could use. And that is the primary reason for seeking out this card and the other options I've got. So let's get them in and we'll try this one out and see if I've screwed it up or if it works. Mm, slightly wonky and uneven seated Yamaha chip there, but it's secure, that's all that matters. One thing I never really thought about before starting all this was this thing only has a 720k floppy drive, and I don't really have much in the way of games on 720k floppies. In fact, I don't have many games on floppy at all, because prior to this my earliest machine was a 486, which has a CD drive, and I don't really have much to hand to put onto this. But I've decided to choose this game, which is Domark's MiG-29M Super Fulcrum. I remember it having a pretty cracking music track at the beginning, so we're going to use that to test the card out. So I did fire this up without a sound card in it, expecting to hear something through the PC speaker, but I seem to have chosen a game that doesn't play music through the PC speaker, which isn't great, so it doesn't give us anything to compare with. So we'll just go ahead and pop the card in and see what that sounds like, or if it works. Uh, we can imagine that the PC speaker would have sounded pretty shit. This game also runs like a three-legged dog on this machine, but we're not really going to play any games on it, we're just going to listen to the music. Okay, Adlib clone installed. Fingers crossed, let's hope it works and let's see what it sounds like. works. Not only does it work, it actually sounds, well, fucking awesome for want of a better expression. So that's damn cool. That's damn cool. What more can I say? I think we're going to take it off and uh, stick that filter kit on now and see if that improves things any. The filter kit consists of a number of ferrite beads and chokes, which I believe are components that cut off high frequencies, so I guess this is kind of cleaning up distortion at the top end of the sound card. Uh, there's a few capacitors on here as well, so it shouldn't take long to put those on. We just need to remove those patch wires that we put on on the first install and replace it with these components. Removing these patch wires also gives me a chance to use a new toy that I got as a Christmas present. It's a desolderer. Now, I could never afford one of those funky electric desolderers, but this one just has like the manual hand pump that you would normally use in conjunction with the soldering iron, but the soldering iron is built into it as well, so you just have one tool that heats up and sucks at the same time, and it seems to work pretty well. Patch wires off, new components on, let's plug this baby back in and give it another go.
that sounds better. I think when you compare it with the uh, non-filtered version, the non-pro version, it sounds beefier and meatier and bassier, I think, and cleaner. I did notice some crackling at the top end, and I think the sound of the original unmodified cards sounds a bit thinner. So I think it's well worth the £7 investment to upgrade that card to the pro version. So I kept looking at 8-bit cards even though I didn't have that kit and I did eventually manage to get one for a reasonable price. So this is just a nondescript, I don't even know who made it, it looks like a Sound Blaster 2 clone card. Nothing, there's some kind of Intel microcontroller on there, there's no real Yamaha chips or anything like that. But uh, it was reasonably affordable, it was about £45 so you're probably looking at knocking on close to twice the price of the adlib kit the standard adlib kit and yeah it was but it was cheap for a card i mean you can get them reasonably priced on ebay but generally speaking you get a lot of buy it nows for around the 100 pound mark i think generally speaking from what i seen looking for these kind of cards over a period of months at least here in the uk you're going to be looking at um between 70 and 100 pounds to buy an 8-bit card a lot of them have to come from the states but we have to pay tax and delivery and all sorts of stuff on top of that so it's quite an expensive thing to buy over here but this one was reasonably priced even though it's not exactly the most desirable card in the world it's kind of ironic as well that back in the day on my 286 and into my 486 days i had a MediaVision Thunderboard 8-bit sound card and god did I load that thing it came out of a bog and bucket all my friends had Sound Blaster 16s and all 32s and what have you and that was the best I could afford and oh god if only I kept it so this is the first run for this card as well I have no idea if this works I bought it on eBay a few months ago and it's been sitting in a box ever since so fingers crossed I think they both sound pretty good and what's better is they both sound quite different so I think they both have very different characters. The Adlib clone is much bassier especially with the filter kit on it and the Sound Blaster clone is thinner, more trebly, maybe even a little bit better defined but I think I probably prefer the sound of the Adlib clone. I just like that bumping bass that it seems to have. So the last thing I did was I tried, um, I've got three non-plug-and-play 16-bit sound cards, so I thought I'd just stick those in and see what happens. Unfortunately, none of them produced a sound. In fact, one of them wouldn't even boot. It was hanging during the boot sequence, so I'm not sure what's going on there. But I did know this was probably not going to work. I used a, a Jazz 16 card and a couple of Aztec cards. I do know there are Aztec cards that do work like this, but... These two, which are Gal Sound Galaxy 16s, don't seem to be among them. So it was worth a shot, but I'm happy with what I've got with the, the two clone cards that seem to work pretty well. So that pretty much wraps it up for this video. I'm pretty pleased with the way this turned out. I'm really pleased with the little kit that I built. Um, I'm glad that I actually have the skills to do that. Gave me a bit of soldering practice and sounds awesome as well. The Sound Blaster 2 clone is also a nice little thing to have. I don't know which one's going to be my favourite, but right now I'm going to put the Adlib clone into the machine and maybe use that other ISA slot for a game port so that I can 
stick a joystick on there and play some games and actually get using this machine because it's just been sitting there for a while. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did I hope you consider giving me a thumbs up or maybe in subscribing and I hope to see you again on the channel in the future. Right now I'll leave you some of that awesome sounds from that AdLib clone card. Thanks for watching, goodbye.